I was falling through a black void. No up, no down, only an infinite blackness in a sense of hurtling towards some unknown source. I was afraid, desperately afraid, that I would be trapped in this aching void forever. How long before I was driven mad by this vast, lonely darkness? But you're not alone, a voice rang through my mind. Lucifer, I whispered. It was much like this when I fell, he said. And I heard his voice, an endless, aching sadness. The only difference was agony. Suddenly there was a searing pain in my back as if something that had never been was torn from me. I screamed, bellowed, twisting and thrashing, desperate to escape this inferno of pain. Now you see, Lucifer whispered almost pityingly. Now you understand. I was falling faster and faster. A great white light pierced the veil of darkness, pulling me in, dragging at me like rusty hooks through my flesh, enveloping me, and just like that, there was bare earth beneath my feet once again. The sudden shock of gravity sent me reeling, and I threw up an arm to break my fall, but it was too late. The ground flew up at me with breakneck speed, filling my vision. There was a jarring pain, and I knew no more. Well, well, a gravelly voice said as a rude finger prodded me in the chest. You're a fresh one. The old doc will pay a fortune for you. I groaned. My eyes creaked open. The man before me let out a cry and let back his lantern bobbing in the darkness. What's this? Still alive, are you? He said, slinking forward. Well, Tom and take care of that. From his scruffy-looking waistcoat, he dragged out a viscous-looking billy club. Now you just stay right there, and old Tom will have you off to the angels in no time at all. No angels, I croaked. Only devils. And then off to hell you go, he snarled through rotted teeth. As he raised the club for the killing strike, from behind me rose a dark shadow, a rotting arm oozing with maggots, wrapping itself around his neck. A face, skull-like and black with rot, came into the light, its tattered lips whispering against his throat. Hell is my dominion, friend. Only I decide who goes there. The man let out a shriek of fear, but it was cut off as the arm clenched tight around his throat. There was an audible snap, and he fell to the ground, in a dusty heap. Mmm, the corpse grinned. That was fun, like twisting the lid off a candy jar. Wonder if he has a gooey center. I coughed nervously. <coughs> Lucifer, is that you? The corpse sighed, and its eyes rolled wetly in its head. No, it's Pablo Escobar. Who the fuck do you think it is? Where am I? Whose body is this? I said, looking down at a hairy hand with thick, brutal fingers. Questions, 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 he said, kneeling down beside me. It was all I could do not to wretch at the smell of him. You're looking a little green around the gills, Mr. Davis. Is something wrong? No, I replied. Peachy Keen. You're sure? He whispered, drawing closer until I could feel his fetid breath on my cheek. Y y yes, my lord, I stammered. Well, that's just fine then, he said, drawing back. Now to answer your questions. You're in the body of a dead man. A cholera victim, to be precise. And for your whereabouts, you're in London. The year of our lord, 1832. You're shitting me, I said, struggling upright, my back pressed against the slime-covered wall. I was suddenly aware of the sound of water in the background and muffled movements up ahead. What is this place? I asked, trying to peer through the gloom. It's a sewer, Mr. Davis, Lucifer replied. You have now been upgraded to the level of a floating turd. <laughs> As for this one, he said, kicking the dead man. He's a corpse peddler. 
The graveyards are becoming a risky business, and he knew that people had been disposing of their dead neighbors down here, so he thought he would pop down and see if he could find himself some fresh meat. Yeah, but why? Mm. Not big on our history, are we, Mr. Davis? He steals dead bodies and sells them to unscrupulous doctors, all in the name of advancing medicine. The man you're looking for is an acquaintance of his, although a little viler. He doesn't wait for someone to die. He makes them die, then sells their nice, fresh bodies. And he's one of the escapees? Yes. Lucifer nodded. A man by the name of Albert Foster. What does he look like? I asked, climbing to my feet. Ah, well, now that's the question, isn't it? You left the file I gave you back on Earth when you destroyed that lovely Miss Thompson, and for that, you have to pay a forfeit. He grinned. Tell me, have you ever heard of necromancy? I was just about to answer, but he waved it away. A rhetorical question, old boy. A rhetorical question. Come, he said, kneeling by the corpse of old Tom and waving me down beside him. Now take your fingers and gouge out his eye. What? Why? He grabbed me then, his rotten bone-like finger digging into my throat. Do it, or I swear by all of hell's minions, I will tear open your bowel and stuff your mouth with your own shit. Yes, master, I croaked. For a moment, his grip tightened before reluctantly letting me go. Still, a dangerous light burned in his eyes, and I knew if I didn't hurry, I'd be tasting my own shit before the night was through. Without another word, I thrust my fingers into the dead man's eye socket and grimaced, tore the bloody eye free. Good, good, Lucifer crooned. Now say the name of the man you seek and pop it right into your mouth. Uh, 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 Albert Foster, I stammered. So great was my fear of Lucifer that I didn't hesitate, but put the bloody eyes straight into my mouth. Now chew it, he demanded. With a grimace, I bit down hard, feeling a cold, jelly-like substance fill my mouth. A face was forming now, a, a man with a broad face and hollow cheeks. A scar ran down the side of his unshaven face, and his eyes were seedy and filled with a stupid animal cunning. I have it, I choked. Well, that's just grand, <laughs> Lucifer laughed. Now swallow it. At the thought of it, I began to retch. I swear by all th that is unholy, if you spit it out, you're going straight back to hell. That really didn't help the situation, and for a moment, I thought with my stomach. But in the end, I managed to keep it down. That's good, Mr. Davis. That's very good indeed. Now, talking of things that you have forgotten, you may need this, he said, drawing the hellbound dagger from behind his back. I was just reaching for it, when with a laugh of glee, he thrust it hard into my thigh. With a scream, I fell back down, cradling my wounded leg, looking on in horror as the skin around the wound began to smoke and blacken. You may want to pull it out before it spreads, Lucifer said thoughtfully. With a cry of pain, I wrenched it free, watching in wonder as the skin began to immediately knit together and heal. Well, I'm glad to see that still works, he said, looming above me. Fuck you. I spat, suddenly furious. What if I said no? Stick your fucking job. Get someone else to do your dirty work. He moved then. Fast as lightning, his face pressed hard against mine. Render unto me, Caesar, the things that are Caesar's, and render unto God the things that are God's. He grated at me through blackened teeth, and I could feel a terrible heat radiating from him. I will let you, he said, licking the side of my face with slime-covered tongue. Figure out who is your 
God. And just like that, he was gone, leaving a rotten corpse in his wake. Hurriedly, I wiped the foulness from my cheek and climbed to my feet, scooping up the glowing lantern as I went. The sewer was dark, the walls covered with all manner of foulness. Tunnels seemed to lead off in every direction, and I began to despair of ever finding my way out of this place. Just then, I felt a scratching at my feet. Looking down, I saw a small mouse looking up at me. Expectantly. What are you? I asked. My spirit animal? The creature didn't reply, thankfully, but scurried off a short way before standing on its haunches and staring at me with black, beady eyes. When I made no move to follow, it scampered back and began gnawing in my work boots savagely. Okay, okay, I said, shaking the little brute free. I can take a hint. Let's go, then. The little fiend squeaked excitedly and scampered away. This time, I did not hesitate, but followed swiftly behind. In no time at all, we came to a rusting ladder... They led upwards to a heavy-looking manhole cover. There, the creature stopped and just stared up at me. So what do you want? I asked. A graham cracker? Go on, get lost. I think I can take it from here. It looked as if to leave before turning back around and trotting towards me. Cocked its leg, almost dog-like, and pissed on my booted foot. Yeah, well, fuck you too, I grumbled. Starting up the ladder. I hope you get gang-fucked by a sewer rat. But the creature had already slid off into the darkness. The manhole cover was cold, dank, and heavy. But after some heaving and groaning, I managed to work it loose and push it to one side, praying that no one would see me emerge from the darkened tunnels. But the cobblestone streets were silent covered with a thick fog that hid my tattered figure as I quickly scrambled free. Once again, I let loose upon the world of men. The question now was where to go. I knew the face of my intended victim, but not his location. Wiping the worst of the filth from me and sticking to the shadows, I moved to the mouth of the alley and peered into the lamp-lit street. It's pretty quiet. A few people walked by, most of them seeming to weave drunkenly. The houses were silent with only the odd light flickering from deep within. Just then, a woman in a tattered-looking dress with a large bonnet on her head staggered by. She saw me and smiled before stumbling over. Evening, Governor. For only a half penny, I can send you to paradise, she said. Massaging her crotch through her filthy dress, I recoiled at the stench of her gin-soaked breath and felt around in my pockets. Coming up empty. Sorry, I said. Seem to be a little short on coin, but I wonder if maybe you can give me a little information. She had already turned to leave. You can go straight to hell, she cursed over her shoulder. Been there, I said, catching her around the wrist and dragging her into the alleyway. She let out a shriek, which I cut short as I wrapped my hand around her neck and began to squeeze. In no time at all, she was unconscious. There was a, a dark part of me that wanted to keep on squeezing, but I, I pushed it away. I, I wasn't that person. Not anymore. Lying her down, I quickly rifled through her dress until I found a small leather purse amongst the many folds. The purse was heavy. Looks like you had a busy night, I said, tearing it loose. Sorry for this, but needs must. And charity will buy you a one-way ticket to heaven. Leaving her there, I headed into the street. I still had no idea where I was going, but now, at least, I had some money in my pocket. Perhaps I could buy a little information. Lucifer had told me that the man he had murdered down in the sewer was a friend of the one I was seeking. A local man, perhaps. That's when it came to me. A good place to begin would be the local tavern. Drink always makes men's lips loose. Perhaps if I asked the right questions and greased a few palms, I could get the information I so desperately needed. I now had a plan. A thin one, but a plan nevertheless. Feeling more confident, I headed into the mist-shrouded streets of Victorian London. It didn't take me long to find what I was looking for. 
Only a couple streets over, I found a body-looking tavern. From inside came the coarse laughter of men and the drunken shriek-like giggling of loose women. Taking a deep breath, I pushed open the swinging door and headed inside, making my way through the smoke-filled room until I reached the bar. There I turned to face the milling crowd, wondering where to start. It was the girl I noticed first. She was sat in a dingy corner nursing a drink. She was young. It would have been pretty except for the livid scar that ran down her face, petering out along the bridge of her nose. She sighed, looking round at the milling men, but none of them met her eye. She sighed again and threw back her drink before standing to leave. Quickly, I pushed through the room until I stood before her. Hello? I smiled. She smiled back, but there was a hardness to her eyes. Guess you'd be wanting a discount on account of this, she said, tracing a slender finger down her scar. No need for that, I said, drawing closer. Do you have a place we can go? Upstairs. Big John likes to keep things in-house. I followed her gaze, locking eyes with the big man behind the bar, who pulled out a piece of hard wood from under the bar and thumped it ominously into his palm. The message was clear. No trouble. I gave him a quick nod before following the girl upstairs and into her shabby lodgings. As soon as the door closed, she fell onto the bed and hiked up her skirt, revealing her flesh to me. Gently, I pushed it back down. I don't want that. I just want to talk. She laughed then. Never had a man that wanted to use my mouth for talking. I ignored that and dug in my pocket, throwing a few coins onto the bed. Her eyes lit up greedily and she scooped up the money and quickly secreted them away. What is it you want to know? I'm looking for a man, a corpse peddler. Maybe a murderer? He has a scar on his face, much like your own. Goes by the name of Albert Foster. Well, you're in luck, then. Everyone around here knows awful Albert. You could have just asked at the bar and saved yourself some money. Thinking you've given me a rebate, are you? I said, rubbing my fingers together. Not bloody likely, she scoffed, her eyes narrowing. And if you try to take it off me, I will cut you. I held up my hands harmlessly. Money's yours. I just need to find him. Could be in a few places. You could try the Black Dog on Winchester Street. He has a room there. Although, this time of night, you might want to try Faith Hill Cemetery. He and his crew pay the local constabulary a fair few copper to look the other way while they pillage graves. And with so many deaths lately, business is rather good. Where is this cemetery? I asked, excited now. She shrugged. Couple streets over. Faith Hill is at one end of the street, the black dog at the other. That's why he hangs there, close to his place of business. Thanks, I said, turning to leave. You may want to be careful, she called after me. Albert's a real bad fella. I turned to her. So am I. She must have seen something in my face that caused her to recoil. Go on, then. Get, she said in a trembling voice. Before I call Big John on ya. I nodded. And left her there. A scarred waif. Living in her own version of hell. Less than an hour later, I stood outside the rusting gates of Faith Hill Cemetery. Deep from within, I could just make out a faint glowing light in the hushed tones of men amongst the leaning tombstones. It can't be this easy. I whispered into the night as I scaled the iron gates, landing hard before pulling out the hellbound dagger and creeping behind a nearby crumbling gravestone. Using the shadows for cover, I crept through the darkness, the voices growing louder. I'm too cold for this kind of work, one of the men growled. Ground's almost completely frozen. Stop your bitching, get on with it, larger of the two men spat, lifting a lantern over the half-defiled grave giving me a glimpse of his face. Albert, I hissed. What was that? The other man said, spinning in the direction. Fuck, I cursed, knowing I had blown my cover. I stepped out from the shadows and faced them. I have no truck with you, friend, I said to the man holding the pick. Best you be on your way. The man said nothing, 
but with a cry of outrage, charged me, his pick held high for the killing stroke. I waited, letting him come on, but at the last second, as the pick whooshed through the air towards me, I ducked low, dragging the blade across his unprotected midriff. The blade cut long and deep, spilling his intestines onto the leaf-strewn floor in a bloody heap. The man fell to his knees, his trembling hands hovering over his stomach like a crippled butterfly. He tried to speak, but I ended his suffering with a stroke of my blade. I turned the face to the now silent Albert Foster, who had watched the whole thing, with a look of bored amusement on his craggy face. You're him, then, he said, backing away from my approach. The Slayer of the Damned, Lucifer's bitch, as Modius said you'd be coming for us. You're going back to hell, I growled, showing him the blood-soaked blade. Really, he laughed. Boy, are you in for such a surprise. Suddenly, he stopped his backpedaling, and he charged me, his grimy fists bursting into flames. What the fuck? I screamed, just managing to avoid his flaming knuckles. A gift from Asmodeus, he chuckled. I'm gonna burn you up, lapdog. I was panic-stricken now. This was not going according to plan. Still, I had the knife. All I needed was one clear shot, and this nightmare would be all over. Come on, then, I said, trying to goad him. Lucifer will stab you with hot irons for your insolence. With a cry of outrage, he lunged at me, but I feigned to the left, drawing him in as I sliced the blade across his arm. With a scream of pain, he backed away, wincing at his smoking flesh. You're mine now. I laughed, running towards him, my blade held high, and that's when my feet tangled in the body of his dead friend, and I went down hard, the blade flying from my grasp. With a roar of triumph, he leapt upon me, pummeling me with his flaming fists. Everywhere a blow landed, my skin began to blacken and burn. I screamed into the night. Half crazed with pain, I tried desperately to throw him off of me, but he was too strong. All I could do now was pray that the end would come soon. The pummeling continued until I was nothing but a burnt-out husk, yet still... I would not die. I could finish you now, Foster goaded, but I prefer to leave you here for the rats. You don't have much time left. What time you do have, will be spent in pain. He stood up then, and undid his rough trousers. I'm not without mercy. See, soothing balm for your terrible wounds. Laughing, he began to piss all over me. There you go, he said. Adjusting his clothes. You tell Lucifer when you get back down to hell, you can kiss my hairy ass. And just like that, he was gone. Fleeing into the night. I lay there for what seemed like an eternity, waiting for my smoldering flesh to heal, but nothing happened. I was just about to give up all hope when I noticed a movement as something small scurried towards me through the gloom. At first I thought it was a rat coming to feast on my smoking flesh, but it wasn't. It was a squirrel. A small, gray squirrel that ran up my leg before bounding onto my chest. Holy shit! It squeaked. Did you see that? That was amazing! The flashing knife, the fiery fists, the bobbing and weaving. That was like a Saturday night blowjob with popcorn. Holy shit! Lucifer, I croaked. Glad you're so entertained. He looked at me with his beady black eyes as if seeing me for the first time. <laughs> well, look at you, Mr. Davis. You're a real mess. Not even the power of renewal is gonna fix this one. You just wait right there. I'll be back in just a jiffy. After what seemed like an eternity, he returned, bobbing along the ground, a swaying man following, laughing and muttering to himself. He stopped close by, giving the drunken man time to catch up. Hey, little fella, the man hiccuped, squinting his eyes. Where'd you go? Over here, Lucifer squeaked. The man staggered over, noticing me laying on the ground. Can you see this? He said, ignoring my burnt state. A talking squirrel. I want to be rich. I'll sell him to the circus. Prepare yourself, Mr. Davis. Lucifer said. When I bring him down, you catch and hold. I'll do the rest. Hmm. Where to start? He tittered. Oh, well, might as well go for the nuts. 
I was just about to reply when the squirrel lunged forward, biting onto the man's groin. He let out a scream of surprise and tripped over his own feet, falling heavily nearby. With the last of my failing strength, I rolled onto my side, grabbed his flailing arms. Instantly, I felt a sensation like falling, constricting for a second. There was only blackness, and then I was there upon the ground, looking through a fresh pair of eyes. I just lay there for a moment, stunned, until the squirrel took a swipe at me, flaying open my cheek. With a cry, I pressed my hand against the bleeding wound, feeling it instantly begin to heal and knit closed under my probing fingers. Well, Lucifer said, looks like everything's back in place. What the hell was that? I said, sitting up. With a flaming f fist, I mean. Looks like our enemy has given our escapee friends a whole new set of tools to work with, Lucifer said thoughtfully. Asmodeus, I said quickly. The name of our enemy is Asmodeus. He laughed at that. I hardly think so. Asmodeus is nothing more than a minor demon in the last circle of hell. Someone is telling lies, Mr. Davis. Our true enemy has yet to reveal himself, but not to worry. This is my end of things. What you need to concern yourself with is your end of the deal. I want Mr. Foster back in hell where he belongs. But how? I asked, tottering to my feet. He's so much stronger than I am. Again, he sighed. Use your brain, Mr. Davis. That animal cunning that helped you murder so many. Find his weakness, or perhaps in this case, his greatest strength. Just get him back in hell. You have 24 hours. Fail me, and no true torment. And just like that, he was gone. leaving behind a very angry squirrel that chattered at me in disgust before scrambling away up a nearby tree. I spent the rest of the night flailing about in the dark, looking for the hellbound blade. Just as the first rays of light began to stain the darkness, I found it, lying at the feet of a nearby stone angel. I was tired. More tired than I'd ever been, and yet I knew I couldn't rest. Foster believed me dead. And that was my greatest advantage. I had to move against him now. When he believed himself safe and secure. The Black Dog Inn. I whispered into the coming dawn. That's what the girl had said. He had lodgings at the Black Dog Inn. The streets were still blessedly free of people. The only activity was an old woman setting up a rickety looking flower stand and the few drunks who had staggered home to whatever hovel they had inhabited. Gently, I tried the front door of the black dog, finding it locked. Nothing's ever easy, I muttered, heading down the side of the building where I came to a weed-strewn yard. Bits of broken glass lay littered all about, twinkling like diamonds in the coming dawn. There was a small set of double doors set low in the back of the building, held loosely together with a flaking chain and rusty padlock, it only took two strikes of the hellbound dagger to send it flying free. I waited there a moment to see if the noise had attracted any attention. There were no cries of alarm were raised. I gently lay open one of the doors and climbed inside. I found myself in a cold, damp cellar. The ceiling was low and covered in cobwebs. The air stank of stale beer and sharp tang of homemade gin. Heading across the room, mindful of the broken glass and grime underfoot, I headed towards a rickety-looking ladder that led up towards a rough-cut trap door. Slowly I climbed, wincing at every creak and groan as I pushed at the door, praying it wasn't locked. Fortunately, this time my prayers were answered and the door swung easily open, admitting me into the upper floor bar room. I was expecting the place to be empty, so you can imagine my surprise when I rose from behind the bar, only to be greeted by a room full of people. Thankfully, they were all asleep. Well, actually, they were... They were all dead drunk. Whores, vagabonds, gentlemen alike, were passed out over tables, others snoring loudly from whatever position they had managed to pass out in. I crossed the room silently, heading to a nearby doorway, checking slack faces as I passed. But Albert Foster was not among these merry assortment. The girl had said that he had lodging upstairs. Same stairs I was now on. 
My back against the wall, creeping through the gloom, the knife grasped tightly in my sweating fist. I was afraid and not ashamed to admit it to myself. In our last encounter, Albert had bested me with ease. If it wasn't for Lucifer's intervening, I would... I'd probably be in my freezing cell or worse. I had a feeling Lucifer could get real creative with those who dared to fail him. There were three rooms left on the floor. The first one was empty, the only furnishing a pair of torn, tattered curtains. The second contained only a single cot, forlorn and empty. I was coming to the last room at the end of the hall now, sweat running down my face. I grasped the tarnished handle and threw open the door. Albert Foster was in his bed. His eyes widened and panicked. I leapt across the room, dagger raised high, sweeping down towards his prone form. At the last minute, he ducked under the covers like a child afraid of the dark, just as my blade pierced his squirming form. Something was wrong. Terribly wrong. With a cry, I threw back his filthy blanket. It was immediately assaulted by hundreds, no, thousands of swarming cockroaches. I fell backwards, landing hard on my ass, but the creatures ignored me, heading towards the open window before falling into the street. Son of a bitch! I cried, leaping to my feet. No way you're getting away! I slammed a boot heel down on one of the scurrying insects, which exploded in a crimson smear. I saw the color of its blood and began to laugh, stamping on the remaining creatures in a kind of ecstasy frenzy, fancying I could almost hear their screams. When the last of them was crushed underfoot, I rushed to the window just in time to see the scurrying pile warp and transform back into the loathsome form of Albert Foster. Oh, well, almost. He was cradling the bleeding stump of his left hand to his chest, from which three of his five fingers were now torn and shredded stumps. As he glared up at me, I caught the last of the fleeing cockroaches and slowly crushed it in my fist. From down in the street, Albert Foster screamed as his nose erupted in a red welter. Run! I grinned down at him. I'll even close my eyes and count to ten. Fuck you! He screamed up at me before turning and fleeing up the street. A bloody trail behind him. I was after him lickety split, leaping from the high window, feeling my ankle break as I landed hard. I ignored the pain, racing after him, feeling my bones almost immediately begin to knit and heal. From across the opposite side of the road came a shrill whistle. I looked around just in time to see a rather large policeman charging at me, baton raised. Drop the knife, he yelled. He was only a few steps away when a black cat suddenly shot out from a nearby alleyway, tangling in his legs, causing him to trip and fall, his helmet flying from his head as he broke his face on the pavement. The cat grinned at me through needle-sharp teeth before dropping me a sly wink and searing off in the shadows. Albert Foster, even injured, had now managed to gain a little distance between us. Cursing, I raced after him, desperate to finish this crazy nightmare. I was gaining on him now. My eyes fixated on the back of his exposed neck. I was just about to take a swing at him when he suddenly veered to the left, crashing through a nearby doorway. The building was large, almost a small warehouse. It was dark inside and reeking of bathtub gin. I heard a clutter and a curse. I ran down a narrow hallway that opened up into a large room filled with jars and kegs. At the back of the room, breathing heavily, was Albert Foster. His back pressed against the stone-cold wall. Nowhere left to run, Albert, I hissed at him. You're going back to hell, where you belong. Come on, then, he growled, stepping forward. We'll see who's exactly going where. I don't need two hands for the likes of you. Just like last time, he raised his hands before me, but this time, only one burst into hellish flames. Still. I had tasted those flames once, and had no desire to do so again. He laughed at me then, sensing my doubt. That's a nice little pig sticker you got there. Let's see if we can get close enough to use it. Lucifer's words suddenly echoed through my mind. Use his greatest weakness against him, or perhaps... His greatest strength. You're right. I laughed at him. I don't need this anymore. That said, I launched the dagger at his face. The second it left my hand, I rolled across the room and scooped up the liquid filled jars. <laughs> you missed, he laughed, turning towards me. Did I? I shot back, throwing the glass jar at him with all of my might. Snarling, he batted it away with his flaming fist, causing it to explode like a bomb in midair, drenching him in almost pure alcohol. 
He began to shriek and dance, his clothes and his hair on fire, giving me just the opening I needed. Dodging the burning figure, I scooped up the hellbound blade and buried it deep in his lower back, severing his spine, causing him to collapse onto the filth-covered floor. His flesh melted like molten wax. Once again, tearing hands appeared out of the flames, dragging him down Albert Foster's writhing soul as it tried to escape his burning body. I'll see you in hell, Albert. I smiled into his screaming face. Seconds later, he was gone, and I was falling once again, tumbling back into Lucifer's great hall. Only this time, it was not stone I landed upon, but flesh, piles and piles of reeking flesh. There were bodies and chunks of bleeding meat scattered all over Lucifer's great hall. The fallen one himself was sat upon his great throne. His armor was dented, and an ugly red scar ran down the side of his left cheek. The hell happened here? I grimaced, wiping blood from my hands as I stumbled to my feet. What's this? He grinned at me through fanged teeth, his eyes burning like hot coals. This was a revolt, a minor one, but a revolt nonetheless. A minor one? I gasped, taking in the devastation all around me. He shrugged. Minor demons driven mad by another's power, sent against me to test my might. What do you think, Mr. Davis? Did I pass? Flying colors, my lord, I quickly answered, terrified by the light of madness that danced in his crimson eyes. So who's next? I said quickly, desperate to be out of his presence. Things have changed, he said, glaring down at me. I have more need of information right now than anything else. I'm afraid our lost souls will just have to wait. You're going on vacation. Hawaii? I blurted. He laughed then. <laughs> I'm afraid not! And once again, he clicked his fingers. And I was falling. I awoke upon a perfectly manicured lawn. It was dusk and the sun was just starting to set. For a moment I thought myself back on Earth, but... But something was wrong. Terribly wrong. The sinking sun was a burning black hole in a crimson sky, and the air was thick, syrupy, hard to breathe. From around the corner of the house kept a dark figure all dressed in black. In his hand he held a small flashlight, in the other a sharp knife. The blade was as black as the mask he wore. No, I gasped, backing away. For the love of God, not this! The figure saw me and strolled casually across to where I stood, rooted to the spot. He raised his mask, and my own face grinned back at me. Welcome to Purgatory, Mr. Davis. Do you remember this place? The screams of your first victims. The blood on your face, he said, catching my flowing tears in his fist. Judgment is at hand. Welcome to the reaping. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta. I just wanted to say thank you so much for listening to tonight's story or watching tonight's video. And if you guys would like to see more or hear more, then I'd appreciate it if you click that subscribe button. Or if you're listening on the podcast, then click the follow button. We're moving into spring, which means that uh, it's getting warmer some places. And also, that means that it's probably good for you guys to get a nice tall glass of iced tea. And if you've been here before, then you know that my wife sells things like tea. So yeah, check out Ivory Monocle Tea. It's etsy.com slash shop slash Ivory Monocle Tea. And as always, I want to give a big thank you to all you guys who support on Patreon, patreon.com slash MrCreepyPasta, especially Jacob Schaefer, Jay, Zach, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Ken Lando Higuchi, Bobby Carmen, Tristan Pelton, Chase Burnett, Diana Krause, Katrina Beasel, Caden the Spooky Boy, Zane Nightshade, My Body Sounds Like Rice Krispies, Ashwood, Lord of the Weebs, Miss Exandra, Mr. Unsettling Spaghetti, Eurogore, Suji Campbell, Marco Takes Dabs 420, Frickin, Azarine Fox, Robert White, Andreas Garza, Snails Brennan, Legit Quad Feed, Fried Chicken 12, James Bruce, Chris Lovin, Freddy Krueger, Ty Nanny, Justin Johnson, 1-800-Nightmare, Unknown Nobody, Michael Scarborough, Jason Wilson, Infernal One, James Lowe, 
Lisa Cottrell, Jimbo the Hutt, Caspian, Jordan Nels, Hades Nephew, Plater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Brian Arse, Cryptic Nightmares, Brennan Wright, Someone You Love, S-Man, Kiwi the Sloth, Liam Newman, Sky Harbor, Caleb Dougal, Nina Smith, Nico Kyle, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Talon Karlick, Daniel Paulson, Trace Miles, and Cordy Kenshin. Thank you guys so much for supporting me, and if you guys would like to join them on the list of people's names I mispronounce, you can always do so at patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta, as well as all those fine people in the description down below who help support this channel and keep the lights on and give treats to Hylas and Hercules. You guys, as always, are the real MVPs, and I love and appreciate every single one of you who support there or just support anywhere by watching and subbing. So good night, everybody and sweet dreams.